Hello, good morning. Happy solstice. My apologies for being a little bit late, having some technical difficulties. Mercury goes direct tomorrow, and apparently we are just having a few hiccups uh, before we get there. So uh, today I'm really excited to be sharing with you some tips about commercial brewing. Um, for those of you who don't know, I am Hannah Crum, the Kombucha Mama. I started Kombucha Camp in 2004 as a workshop in my home. I then started blogging online as kombuchacamp.blogspot.com back in 07 and then um, launched my e-commerce store with my husband in 2010 and kombuchacamp.com. In 2010, we had the um, what we call the great kombucha withdrawal. Some mistakenly call it a recall. That is not what happened. Um, but it does relate to the trace amounts of alcohol present in kombucha, which essentially were found to be higher than the legal limit. And despite there being no complaints from consumers, um, the grocery stores feared being liable for products not being in compliance. So they asked all of the kombucha producers to buy back their kombucha, which was incredibly um, chaotic and was a bit of a crisis in our industry. And out of that crisis, like any crisis, <laughs> um, solutions, ideas, and thoughts were created. And that is where the plan for Kombucha Brewers International, the little seed was planted at that time during this crisis because the thought process I had was, well, hey, if we had already been organized as an industry, would this situation have played out in this way? Now, unfortunately, um, this crisis created a lot of fear in our industry and it's taken many, many years for us to even try to come back together and work together, which of course has been one of my missions, my life's work. Um, you know, when I started blogging in 07, I immediately reached out to kombucha brands, started interviewing them. I collected every brand on the side of my website because I was just really excited about anybody who was pursuing this from a commercial um, perspective. I loved kombucha so much. I know I wanted to share it with the world. I loved meeting other people who had that same thought process. And so um, that is what sort of led to the first conversations about starting KBI, Kombucha Brewers International, which I co-founded with my husband, Alex Liguori, in 2014. Um, prior to that, <clears throat> prior to it actually launching, because we started out with KombuchaCon, January 18th, 2014, in Santa Monica. Um, in 2011 and 2012, Alex and I spearheaded some cross-platform marketing promotions on Facebook called New Year's Revolution, Re-Evolution, capital E, in order to just raise awareness of kombucha uh, across the globe, across the platform, and we had different brands promoting each other. And part of that in 2012 was the 30 day kombucha challenge, which has just recently been revived this month. Um, you know, you can start at any time. It's an email series, but we, we've been doing it together here. Cheers to all my 30 day kombucha challenge folks. The idea behind that was simply swap your soda, your energy drink, just one of those sort of beverages that maybe don't actually support your health as well as you would like with kombucha for 30 days and just observe what kinds of changes you might notice when you start drinking it on a regular basis. So I'm um, really excited to be uh, doing that 30 day kombucha challenge again. So check out the link in the profile if you wanna learn more about that. So this is my long rambly story about KBI and the commercial industry. So, um, so we did those promotions. Then in 2013, I started traveling around the country and telling people, hey, I'm going to start this trade association. Will you join? And in 2014, in January 2014, we had 40 brands from around the globe uh, join us in Santa Monica for our first annual Kombucha Con. And that is what launched KBI, Kombucha Brewers International, where I serve as president and uh, Alex is chairman of the board. You know, we have grown and shrunk tremendously over the years, obviously, as sort of everything has ebbed and flowed, but we've also made some really monumental um, important steps for the industry. And um, I'm sharing all of this context with you before I dive into the questions, just so that you have a little bit of an understanding of the tension between home-brewed kombucha, got my little Hannah's homebrew right here, my love potion, blueberry lavender rose, cheers, and um, commercial kombucha, which of course, I, like everybody else, started out drinking commercially brewed kombucha. 
Now my first kombucha, and yours might be different, but mine was a GT's Ginger Aid. And when I had that first sip in 2002, oh, it was like love at first sip. I was somebody who was sad, standard American diet, eating basically crap food and not feeling so great. So when I encountered the living nutrients and enzymes in kombucha, it just woo, really woke my body up and said, hey, here's something you could really benefit from enjoying. And because I'd been the pickle juice lover, like I would sneak the pickle juice out of the jar. My mom would always yell at me and she caught me. She's like, oh, that's too sour. It's so bad for you, it's too much salt. Maybe I was salt depleted because it's one of those vital nutrients that we <laughs> are sometimes missing as much as there's too much salt in processed foods. Um, I digress as usual, but, uh, <laughs> but that was to say I fell in love. And like many folks, my thirst outgrew my budget, which is why I started making it at home. And what I love about kombucha as, as that product is that it's also something that when you fall in love with this process, when you fall in love with that culture, when you're making your kombucha and now you're sharing it with friends, you're sharing it with coworkers and people are like, oh my gosh, this is so delicious. You should sell this, right? Uh, they encourage you to dive on in and make a business out of it, not realizing all of the different intricacies that go along with launching a food business. And especially with a business, with a product that, you know, does create alcohol. And even though the alcohol in kombucha is not intoxicating, in fact, it's a vital nutrient um, in my book, but it's also a preservative. So the alcohol in kombucha is there to prevent mold. This is why it's one of the safest beverages we can make at home, uh, fermented foods, because it has all these natural defense mechanisms. That alcohol also helps you to absorb the nutrients. So um, there's some really vital properties there, but we also have outdated laws here in the United States and in other parts of the world that say when you cross a threshold of half a percent alcohol by volume, that means your product needs to be classified as an alcoholic beverage subject to taxes and has to be handled in a very different supply chain than the one we have for just getting food and vegetables and things to people. And that becomes a challenge and a problem. And that challenge and problem is what initiated the entire industry, um, you know, this association to begin with. Um, but we've done a lot of things. So here's a couple of the things and then I'm gonna start answering your questions. But some of the things we've done is last July, we launched our code of practice. So again, if we had started that code of practice in 2014 or maybe even 2010, it would be tea, sugar, SCOBY, that would be it. There'd be no other sort of variations per se. Um, but because of this whole alcohol issue, brands took different approaches. So some brands invested in dealcoholization equipment, which is really costly, but of course it removes the alcohol and allows you to then have a non-alcoholic product without changing your fermentation process. So you ferment the kombucha as you normally would, use the spinning cone column that's used in the wine industry. It takes all the alcohol out, perfect. Now you have a compliant product. Other people, um, chose to pasteurize or to use kombucha from concentrate. When you ferment kombucha so that all of the sugar is fermented out of it, you have a zero sugar product. Of course, it's really sour at that point. We need to dilute it, we need to flavor it. Um, a lot of people will, uh, a lot of brands will also add probiotics and things like that to it. Um, and so, so those are just some of the, the ways people try to deal with it. Now, others have tried to approach it from the fermentation process standpoint. So we've seen innovations in equipment, such as the symbiosis fermenter. What we've learned over time is that what we really want is wide, shallow, right? Think about it. When you're taking a counterculture, you know, something you do in a one gallon jar on your counter for seven days and try to mass produce that on a huge scale, naturally you're going to run into issues of consistency and things like that. And so that is where there's so many different approaches available. But alcohol does remain one of those questions that we have to deal with. And so if you're here in the United States, whether you're a consumer, a producer, whatever, I highly suggest you go to, I wanna say there's a link in our profile and sign the petition. Sign the petition that supports the Kombucha Act. So this is the other thing we've been doing in addition to launching a code of practice, helping people understand the different types of kombucha, advocating for transparent labeling so that consumers can instantly see what type of kombucha they're purchasing. Is it pasteurized? Is it from concentrate? Is it a raw traditional? So I know it has a shorter shelf life. I need to consume it more rapidly. 
Um, we've also been working on the Kombucha Act. So this act specifically raises the taxation threshold on kombucha from half a percent ABV to 1.25%. So this number harmonizes with Canada, which is 1.1, Mexico is 2%, a lot of Europe is 1.2, uh, Australia also has 1.1, so there's a lot of places across the globe where there are these more common sense type uh, thought processes around these trace amounts of alcohol. And so, um, highly please, please, please go uh, hit that petition button. We really need your senators, your representatives to hear that you want them to support this act um, because this will create this buffer for our kombucha producers. And for those of you tuning in who want to be producers yourself, this is incredibly crucial because it allows you to continue to make a traditionally brewed kombucha. Of course, you're still going to have to make some um, tweaks to your process in order to ensure that it's compliant, but it also ensures that, like a piece of fruit, when your product leaves the facility, should it be temperature abuse, should you know it get stuck on a dock for some time, once it's out of your hands, it's out of your control. And so should it be temperature abuse, that alcohol level rises slightly, now you're not going to be penalized. You're not going to be forced into paying taxes on your product. You're not going to force your consumers to go to the beer aisle <laughs> to find their health beverage. So it just is a lot of common sense. All right, that was my soapbox. Thank you so much for the history, <laughs> listening to the history lesson and uh, hearing about the petition. Now I'm going to dive into some questions. Of course, if you have any questions at all, drop them in the little question here and I will um, answer them as best as I can. So as I mentioned, I had a few technical issues this morning. So my, normally I have it right here, but I gotta look a little farther. Okay, so Justin Marine said, here, we're gonna get a little closer. Justin Marine, my question has to do with making my final bottles, bottled product clear and smooth. I make kombucha a gallon at a time. I F1 for eight to 10 days, then mix with puree and let steep for a day. Should I do this in the fridge? Then strain with an ordinary fine mesh strainer, then bottle. I always have mini scobies in my bottles. It puts off people here. I prefer a clear brew, a little sediment is fine. So should I use whole fruit to steep? How long is there a type of strainer that takes out more fine particles? Is there a better way to impart fresh fruit flavor without clouding up my brew, creating scoby and products? So Right, again, this is that tension between the home brewer who knows that their living product is going to manifest a SCOBY because that's a sign of health and vitality versus the consumer who's used to having beverages that don't have um, extra things floating in them unless it's like chia seeds or boba and you have specifically purchased it for that texture element. So um, yes, you can F1 and uh, you can F2 in the fridge. So that is a way that some commercial producers will do it. They'll do their F1, they'll do their ferment, their primary fermentation. That's F1, um, and then they will infuse with their juice and put it right into the fridge. There's no straining. So when you're using a puree, because you have larger chunks, that is going to necessitate likely going through a straining process. There are many different micron filters available to you out there. Um, this is the part where I break down a little because the numbers always sort of confuse me, but I want to say a 50 micron filter is probably good for that. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I think that that'll be, that'll be good. As long as you're not less than a 0.45 micron, which would be considered sterile filtration, which takes like everything out. And remember the yeast are larger than the bacteria. And so more often than not, when we're using a micron filter, it's intended to remove those large particles of yeast. Why? because the yeast is what creates the alcohol by converting the sugar. If you infuse fruit into your primary fermentation in 2F, you're potentially allowing that alcohol an opportunity to continue to elevate because you've reintroduced, pardon me, my kombucha burps. Um, you've reintroduced a fermentable sugar into the bottle. And if you don't remove the oxygen from the bottle, you will end up with a little scoby. See, I've got one growing right here. I don't know if you can see it. I can see it. Yeah, there you go. Um, and why that happens is because, so for example, this bottle was filled up to here. Well, there's still air in here. And these are tight, but they're not airtight. And so oftentimes we use things like forced carbonation, where we put CO2 into the liquid. That creates your consistent bubble, but also removes the oxygen because the oxygen is what is, is allowing the fermentation to continue to happen. Now that will also change the flavor profile in the bottle in addition to getting you a little scoby. Now back in the day, uh, when you bought a GT's ginger ale, you got a scoby sometimes in your mouth. I remember the first time that happened, I, I did a spit take just because I wasn't quite ready for it, you know. 
your, your body instinctually is like, whoa, that's not supposed to be there. Now, of course, I'll let them get into my glass and I toss them back like an oyster shooter. So there's a couple of things here. You can um, try these techniques to shift and minimize that, but then you also probably wanna educate your consumer and let them know, hey, there's living strands of culture in here and that is not a bad thing. If you don't wish to consume it, of course you can strain it out, but if you want that little extra you know, hit of bacteria and microorganisms, go ahead and toss it right back. So um, the couple of things I pointed out here was to use a micron filter in order to, a 50 micron filter in order to filter out the large particles so that your product's a little bit clearer. Um, you know, I don't do puree and that's why this is so very clear because I'm just infusing whole frozen blueberries in here. Now that might not be the most cost effective way, but I'm not doing it commercially. That's what I do for myself, but that gives it this beautiful clear color. Another option would be to do juice instead of puree because then you won't have that extra particulate. You likely won't even need to do it for a filtration step. And then you'll have a clearer product. Again, the forced carbonation or anything you can do to minimize the amount of oxygen in the bottle is going to help um, with the reduction of growing scobies in there as well. So those are just some of the steps we can do to manage that issue. Okay, let's see if I can see this far. Tanks that allow the ferment for kombucha. Yeah. So because we're a young industry and we're still growing, um, there hasn't been a lot of equipment specifically di designed for kombucha. As I mentioned earlier, there's a tank called Symbiosis Fermenter. Um, it's made by Stout Tanks. They did it in collaboration with Barabucha. Um, and uh, it's like dresser drawers in a way. It's kind of like these long, shallow trays. And as I said before, this more surface area, here's what it does. So the more surface area you have and the less depth, the more of the um, bacteria get access to oxygen or air because air is more than just oxygen and that allows for the fermentation process to occur. So let's go back to some basics here. Sugar, right? We have sugar in our primary fermentation. And yes, I did see filtration question there. So I've got you, Sibakani. Um, so sugar, the yeast, excrete the invertase that cuts it into the fructose and glucose. Those smaller molecules are utilized by um, the organisms and um, are utilized by the organisms and then that creates ethanol. So the, the yeast also create ethanol as part of this process. And again, the really brilliant part of creating the ethanol is it outcompetes other organisms. It prevents mold and other things from colonizing that delicious sweet tea. And it also has a nutritional benefit to the consumer in that it thins the blood, makes it easier for us to absorb those nutrients. Now, of course, as we've already mentioned, we want to manage the amount of alcohol present in our kombucha because our current compliance laws here in the United States stipulated half a percent, and that's true in a lot of places. And so when we have this more surface area, more of that alcohol is able to be converted more rapidly, right? If we go skinny and narrow, there's not a lot of surface area, and it's more difficult for that air to penetrate all the way to the bottom of the ferment. And so if we do wide and flat, which I know you can't see my hands because wide and flat, <laughs> um, that again allows for more of that exchange to naturally occur. So without making a lot of tweaks in your process, just simply changing the shape of your equipment, you can have a different process. Now here's the problem, right? The reason we love tall and skinny in the beer industry or whatever is because you can squeeze a lot of tanks into a smaller square footage, right? You can go really tall with your ceilings and put massive tanks in there. Now, if we do massive tanks and we have to do some form of oxygenation, which is again, normal in the beer or wine industry. I don't know if they do that in wine, so don't take my word for that. But um, definitely in the beer industry, um, adding oxygen or pumping air through a system is normal. Same in making vinegar. So when you make com vinegar commercially, it's often like rotated through different machines and air is added to it. And that just hastens that vinegaration process, which is we're essentially tea vinegar. It's just, um, we're harvesting it before it's too sour so that we can enjoy this. Um, so equipment is one of those ways that you're going to want to use. Now stainless steel is a really common material, but we've also seen people using food grade plastic. So I know there's sort of a negative thought process about plastic and you know, I, I understand that of course, but sometimes we have to balance budget <laughs> and practicality with um, available tools. And so uh, oftentimes a smaller brand will start with a food grade plastic, but then they'll often evolve into stainless steel, which is just a more expensive material um, to purchase and work with. 
but both of those materials are gonna be great. Some people do oak barrels, that's its own kind of special process. Um, of course, we've seen, I don't know if you've seen, but on Health Aid, they sometimes show, they do everything in like two and a half gallon beehive jars, which is really intense. That's a lot of labor, that's a lot of, um, thing, you know, GTs. Uh, does a small batch similar to that. So, you know, <laughs> you want to talk about uh, taking your home brew to a massive scale. That that's Those are two brands that are doing it. Um, a lot of other folks, so they're using uh, various equipment fixes and, and other things in order to make that more compliant. So those are the types of tanks. And then I see um, uh, that was from Kombucha and my eyesight's not this great. Okay. Avani. Um, let me go look at the next question. So about the, the filter, yes. Yeah. So some people filter from F1 just depending on if their F2 is going straight into the bottle. So for example, if you're doing juice, you might not need to strain it again after you've done, after you've infused the juice. And so you would filter at your F1 stage and then infuse with the juice right into the fridge or bottle, however you're doing that. Um, for other folks, you might infuse with fruit and pieces of things that need to be strained out, at which point you'd strain at that point. Because here's the thing, every time we strain out the yeast, we're removing the potential for natural effervescence, we're removing some of the flavor elements, and then we're also, um, uh, yeah, some of the flavor components as well, uh, the effervescence, and of course, then the ability to make alcohol. That's the third one, all right. So that tanks was from Kombucha Axum. I just answered the question that I saw popped up here. Let me click this little question button and see what else we have here. Oh, uh, why don't SCOBY's grow in commercial booch, but it does in bottled at home booch? Well, okay, so again, this depends on the brand. So if your product is from Concentrate, you might not ever get a SCOBY to grow. And I really think this is a great way for anybody, consumer, producer, whatever, to sort of test the products they're purchasing. Um, you know, try to grow a SCOBY. Does it grow a SCOBY? Or is it something that just never grows a SCOBY? It'll also help you understand if there's filtration happening. Because again, when we filter out the yeast, some of the bacteria also get filtered out, and that means it can be um, less able to reproduce, right? And so there have been some folks who've advocated like, well, you can't call it kombucha unless it creates a scopy. Now, um, <laughs> as the president, and my job is to encourage, you know, anybody buying commercial kombucha, we recognize that we want everybody to be drinking kombucha. And not everybody who can benefit from kombucha will necessarily be the type of person who loves finding a scoby in their bottle. And so it's really important, just like juice, right? We, we know there's fresh squeezed juice and we buy that at certain times and that has a certain um, uh, recognition to it. We understand what we're buying. We know it's gonna be fresh and healthy and all the nutrients are gonna be instantly util uh, utilizable. Um, we can uptake that nutrition and then there are going to be times when we buy juice from concentrate because that's just easier and we know it's going to have a longer shelf life and it's got to last for the whole week or whatever that is. And then sometimes we buy pasteurized juice because now it's not from concentrate but it's pasteurized. Again, we're getting that longer shelf life. And so, you know, as much as there are purists out there and I have been in that purity camp for sure. Um, I also recognize that it's more important that people are drinking kombucha versus all these other uh, processed products. And so it's important that we acknowledge and respect the diversity of our culture, of our industry. Now, of course, what I help teach people about mostly is brewing traditionally fermented kombucha, which is similar to homebrew, but at a commercial scale. So let's see, that was a question from here. Tips to get necessary licensing when still home brewing, no money for commercial space. California, sorry, not possible. And here's why. Unfortunately, when cottage food laws were being um, implemented or people were being interviewed about them, they reached out to some commercial producers who said, oh no, there's no way you can make this commercially at home and be safe, which is awful because it's not true but unfortunately that is what has stuck and so you will need to get a commercial space what you can do in the meantime is of course make your test batches dial in your recipes flavor experiments connect with other people but you are going to need to be in a commercial space in order to operate a kombucha brewery commercially in the united states now in europe i've heard of plenty of people who are able to set up a kitchen in their home and they're able to um, make it out of their home and sell it at the farmer's market. That just isn't the case here in the United States uh, because when those um, 
cottage food laws were being made, it just wasn't gonna be permissible. Now here's the other thing about the cottage food laws is they have really tight restrictions on how much money you can make from the products you're making at home. And so, um, you know, that's another limiting factor there. How to maintain carbonation from 2F to bottling. Right, so the reason that's challenging is because CO2 is a gas, right? We've all at some point in our lives probably had a soda, a bottle of soda. You leave the cap off, you come back 24 hours, and blah, it's just like gooey syrup with no fizz. It's disgusting, and that's because CO2 is a gas and it dissipates. So you need to have a cap that is going to help hold in the carbonation. And this is also why ultimately a lot of commercial brands will use a combination of natural effervescence and forced carbonation. So forced carbonation is a bit of a standard in our industry because the consumer has that expectation that there's gonna be a certain amount of bubble present. And so you guarantee that with the forced carbonation but it doesn't have to be forced to the point where that's the only fizz. You can also allow for some natural effervescence to be there. And you can see it when you pour it. You're not gonna see it in mine because my I don't have a lot of fizz in my kombucha today, but when you pour a naturally effervescent kombucha, the bubbles are many different sizes. They pop at different rates and they feel softer on the tongue. When you have forced carbonation, the bubbles are uniform, they pop at the same rate, and they also have a pick, a peak sensation on your tongue. So. Um, you can start to train yourself to see the differences in those carbonation by observing uh, your home brew versus something you're buying at the store. So how to maintain it? Forced carbonation, tight lids, good seal, those are the ways to do it. Uh, so any tips for small batch bottling efficiencies currently using a ladle on a funnel? Okay, so usually the first next step for bottling after hand pouring is a keg and so when you put your product and you put five gallons in a keg horny keg sankey keg um, the differences between those two are their couplers and so you'll just want to research which keg is going to be right for you at kombuchabrewers.org um, any kbi member has access to our draft uh, quality standards manual that's just a free benefit of being a member we have low monthly memberships 38 dollars a month is what we're starting at that gets you access to a massive resource library of tons of recorded content Plus, every month we do um, a round table with a specific theme, but then of course you can ask any question you like. Uh, we also have a HACCP plan template, which is really crucial for those of you just getting started out. Here at Kombucha Camp, we also custom make HACCP plans, um, but that'll cost you $750 versus $38 a month over at KBI. So pick whichever's easier for you. I'm happy to make your HACCP plan, and I make it super easy for us to do it, and then I train you on all the points of it um, with my services, but of course, if you are more DIY and you need to save some money, then you might consider just joining KBI. But a keg, so you put your kombucha in the keg, you use a gun to put it into your bottles. That is the next step. From there, go to YouTube and Google like home, you know, uh, DIY bottling systems, and you'll see there you can buy certain types of equipment, attach them to something, and then you'll have like nozzles that you can do it. Now, it's not gonna be automated. Um, there is going to be a point in your commercial life when it's going to make more sense to make the investment in a canning line, in a bottling line, because where it took an entire eight hour shift for one person to do X, Y, or Z bottles, now it's going to take a couple hours. And what that does is it gives you back efficiency from those employees and makes their lives a little bit better because now they're not stuck bottling all day long. But again, that growing in stages and so you have to pick where you're at and what makes the most sense for you but most brands are not starting out with a bottling line as the first purchase simply because they're very expensive and you need to figure out a lot of other pieces moving pieces before you jump right into that all right um what does it mean numbers on refractometer yeah refractometers are challenging because while they're accurate for higher alcohol content beverages in terms of determining an alcohol content because our product has more trace amounts of alcohol, it's not as accurate. And so it can be used as sort of an, a really rough in-house guide to understanding your sugars and your um, alcohol, but here's the problem. So the refractometer is designed to, um, so here's what happens, it's called refraction because light is shown through the liquid. Pew, light goes through here. There's an angle at which it refracts based on the amount of sugar present in that solution. So right, sugar is sort of like crystals 
and when the light hits it, it refracts at a specific angle, and that indicates how much sugar is present. Now with kombucha, our sugar isn't just sucrose. It's fructose, it's glucose, it's already been broken down in these smaller components. And so, again, it's a gross tool in that it can get a, um, it can measure um, a larger subset, but it can't measure that finer subset. And so ultimately what most brands will end up using is like a Rita Cube from our Biofarm. This is a multitasker unit that not only measures ethanol, it can also measure sugars, it measures acidity. So those are sort of the three, those are the three metrics we wanna dial in on. Yes, pH can be helpful and it's really a food safety, but without knowing your titratable acidity or how much acetic acid is present, it's gonna be really difficult to nuance your profiles. And so measuring all three of those is gonna really help. So you can check out uh, kombuchabrewers.org. We have a approved um, ethanol methodologies, and that's gonna talk about refractometers and some of the other tools out there. Plus the most recent issue of Symbiosis Magazine, symbiosismag.com, that is the journal of Kombucha Brewers International, where I am, uh, of course, editing every piece. But we have a really great um, article in there looking at all the different types of equipment used for testing different things in kombucha from a commercial perspective. Okay, another question, do you clean up the vessels after every batch? Well, so when we're home brewers and we know we're the ones consuming it, we can be a little more lax. When it comes to a commercial situation, you're going to need to have cleaning protocols in place. Um, so as long as you have a schedule that makes sense, um, and, and that can vary from brand to brand, person to person, like are you emptying the tank every time, then yes, you should clean it. If you're only taking it to a partial level and then filling it back up, you probably wanna clean that out once, every couple weeks, once a month. So again, each person's process is going to vary. And that's what we do at Kombucha Camp. So when I'm working with you as a commercial consultant, I'm not just giving you a cookie cutter, here's the way to do it. That's not my process. My process is, I wanna hear what you're doing, I wanna hear the style of kombucha you're trying to make. Now let me give you some tips on how you can continue to make that great kombucha you're making, um, but do it in a way that, um, harmonizes with what you need to do at a commercial level. So I'm really not into cookie cutter. There are people out there who will teach you a cookie cutter method, but I'm really about supporting you in making your unique product with some great best practices. Um, how to stop fermentation for exporting? Okay, well, you've got to pasteurize it, you've got to sterile filter it, you've got to, right, like how do we stop fermentation is we have to kill the microbes in some way. So if it's pasteurization, we're using heat, if it's preservatives, that's chemical uh, sterilization or chemical pasteurization. If we're using sterile filtration, which is what I mentioned before, less than 0.45 micron filter, essentially it's so tiny uh, a hole that everything that gets pushed through it, it just removes everything, like there's nothing left. And so that makes it a shelf stable product. And so for example, jar kombucha out of um, England does that process. Um, there are several others who may not <laughs> put it on their label, but are doing that process. And again, so anytime you're coming across a kombucha that claims to be shelf stable, you have to wonder, is it from concentrate? Is it pasteurized? So like Kavita, for example, is both from concentrate and pasteurized. Um, it doesn't always say it on the, on the bottle, but that's exactly what the code of practice is intended to do, is to make that communication clear to the consumer by putting transparency there. Um, how to stop carbonation after bottling. So again, it's using some form of control. Now, if you're doing a raw traditional kombucha, um, then you are probably going to want to um, use refrigeration. So refrigeration cold supply chain is the way we try to, like think of, again, go back to fruit. Think about this as a living piece of fruit. How do we keep fruit? Okay, now these days we spray a bunch of weird chemicals on them so they can't continue to, um, you know, rot in the store and that's not good either. So think about buying fruit from your farmer's market, right? They're not putting any weird chemicals on it to retard the natural process of the fruit continuing to mature. Um, but you keep it in cold storage. And so that's the same thing we do with our raw living, traditionally fermented kombuchas, we keep it in cold storage and cold supply chain becomes really important. The challenge is there's not a robust cold supply chain um, in a lot of places. So for example, in Europe, it's really challenging because you have you know, buildings built 
hundreds of years ago before refrigeration was even a thing. And now you're asking these places, which are traditionally have really small spaces, to also store your product cold before they sell it. So they have to store it cold, sell it cold, and that can become challenging in different places. In the U.S., we have a little more flexibility. It's a little bit bigger. We were built later. Um, there is more cold supply chain. But again, it can be challenging in terms of finding those right places to do that. So, all right, um, let's see. Gonna check the time real quick here and if there are any more questions so let me just share a little bit about the commercial services perfect the commercial services we have available here at kombucha camp so when you work uh, with the kombucha mama you are working with me uh, the way our consultation works is like this so it's $350 for an hour which is actually 75 minutes because we include a 15 minute follow-up now those 75 minutes are yours to slice and dice any way you like uh, after you sign up for the consultation and the product is in our store, so you can find the store link in the profile or just email customer service at kombuchacamp.com. I'm always happy to help. Um, then what happens is, okay, sorry, I get distracted when I see the questions. I see the question, Maddie, I will answer it. But um, <laughs> so after, so then you're sent an intake form. The intake form just allows you to focus and put all of the issues that are most pressing to you right in one place. So before we even get on the call, I'm already aware of what your most pressing issues are. The first call usually is 30 minutes, 45 minutes. It can even be an hour. It's really up to you and how much information you want to glean from that first call. Cause I'm going to like download a ton of information. After that first call, you then receive access to our consultation resources guide. So it sounds a lot fancier than it is. It's a Google doc with a bunch of information, supplier links, um, tips and techniques specific to the commercial brewing industry, but it has a lot of great detailed information and it's organized with bookmarks and whatnot. So it's easy for you to find exactly what you're looking for. So some of the techniques we'll refer to in the consultation and then you'll find step-by-step -step instructions on how to execute those in the resources guide. At that point, any time that's left remaining is yours to use whenever you feel like. So as long as I'm alive and still doing this, um, I've had people two years later come back and use their last 10 minutes, 15 minutes. So again, we're gonna honor your time. Uh, you paid for it. I'm happy to give you the knowledge whenever you're ready for it. But what this does is it allows me to understand your process, hear your pain points, give suggestions. Now you can go and work with it, try to solve some of those issues. Other pain points arise, other issues, you've got feedback, you come back, we talk about it again, and that way we can get, um, get you tweaking your process. And, and, and sometimes it's just valuable to have someone with expertise to confirm, am I on the right track? Am I doing this right? Um, you know, again, because of that crisis in our industry, we still are a relatively closed industry, unlike our beer buddies who are all open. You know, I really love that Greg Cook, who at the time was the CEO of Stone Brewing, was our very first keynote speaker in 2014. And his advice, I repeat it all the time, is get over yourselves. In 20 years, everybody's going to know anything anyway. So what is that, uh, 2034? <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't take that long. Uh, for us to get there, but the idea is start sharing now because when it comes to craft beverages, we're not competing, um, we're competing on flavor profiles. Now, of course, this also means we need to keep growing consumer interest. And so the more people are drinking kombucha, the more shelf space there is for kombucha, the more players can be involved in the kombucha industry. And so, you know, it just takes more education, more time to help people understand why um, they need to be investing in their health and how kombucha can help them do that on a daily basis. So um, other services we have, we also offer DNA sequencing with our lab partners. So knowing your culture is key to understanding your parameters, right? Our dominant yeast here at Kombucha Camp, and yes, we do sell our cultures and starter liquid at wholesale to help you scale up. We also offer a letter of guarantee, even if you just buy one SCOBY from us. A lot of, a lot of um, inspectors will need a commercially purchased SCOBY. And while we're not currently organic certified, we've only ever used organic ingredients, and many people have used our letter with their organic certification and, and purchasing our, our SCOBY and liquid at wholesale. Um, so SCOBY and liquid at wholesale, and then the DNA sequencing. So our dominant yeast is Britannomyces bruxellensis, which is which has very specific. Um, um, yes, we do ship to the UK, Mucha, um, but they it, they have specific temperature requirements. And so once you know what your yeast needs, that's how you create a sustainable environment for your product. 
And this is well known in the beer industry where different types of yeast require different temperatures. And so again, we're a young industry, we're just learning this, we don't have the benefit of hundreds of years and billions of dollars of research, but that's all starting to come. And so um, you can also find information at the research.kombuchabrewers.org, that's a research database that Alex and I built, and um, now it's housed on Kombucha Brewer. So you can find a lot of research on different types of yeast. So we do DNA sequencing, we offer culture and liquid at wholesale, um, we also have our tea blends at wholesale, so some brands love our tea blend and they use it and makes the best tasting kombucha. We have to admit we like to brag about that. Um, and then yeah, custom. So custom solutions. I've worked with folks helping them figure out distribution. I've worked with folks helping to cost out their, their inventory and what, you know, what price should they um, be charging for their product. And uh, so there's lots of different ways. So even if there's something different or unusual, please bring it to me. I love solving puzzles and working with you to figure it out. I'm gonna answer one last question, I'm gonna to have to go, but um, obviously I'm excited to have y'all here and uh, love helping and supporting people. So um, Maddie, I said I'd answer your question, Maddie BFF. Since raw kombucha doesn't really go off, who, how can you decide the length of shelf life? So this has to do with alcohol compliance. You are correct. We really should, like wine, just have a born on date for our product because it never does go bad. Now it might not taste good, but I've had many bottles where a year later, pull it out of the fridge, fantastic. In fact, even better than you might imagine after a couple weeks or even a few months. Um, but that said, it's all about compliance. And so um, we do our shelf life testing by holding retention samples. So you'll make your batch, you'll make extra so that you have retention samples, you stick them in a fridge, and then every month, every two months, every three months, you'll pull a bottle out and you'll test it again. And so at the point at which it starts to creep above that half a percent or 1.1% or whatever your compliance number is, that's how we determine shelf life. Or if you notice the flavor starts to go off after a certain point. So holding retention samples, and you can do a lot of this stuff in-house as opposed to having it done at a lab, um, can really help you with that. So thank you everybody. Sorry I wasn't able to get to every single question. So glad to have you here. I hope you'll re reach out and ask for more info about our consultation services and how we can support you um, as a home brewer going into a commercial business. And uh, really appreciate seeing you again. Thank you. Don't forget to trust your gut.